Welcome all back to Human Humane Architecture, broadcasting live here from Honolulu, Hawaii. This is the show that is looking for progressive, positive propositions, proposals for our peril dies in peril for the proletarians. And we continue to look architecturally critiquing what's going on in terms of dwelling and dignity here on the islands particularly on this island of Oahu here. In the last show, we spotted something promising, the Hale Nohona, which uh, in the neighborhood, which seems to become our proletarian hood. And that's the one you can see here in the background here, to the left and to the right. And today we're going to uh, take a look closer at what you see behind me. And uh, if we can please go to the next slide here. Uh, so up there, you can see uh, the last couple of shows, we already made an indication about that project. It's pretty much uh, the Howard Hughes Corporation, who is nestled in that area, has done lots of high-end stuff and felt obligated and was forced, both of them, probably uh, together to do something more, which I call affordable. So this is their attempt, and we will take a closer look at that. And uh, next slide being an architect by training here, and we want to educate. Uh, first, we want to look at the floor plan. But the most important thing is the guy up at the very right there, which is the north arrow. So we want to see how the building is positioned uh, as far as how it's um, confronting being an, an, an artificial uh, architectural environment, how it's sort of confronting and living in balance or not with the natural environment. So um, if the camera could go back to um, the studio here, I picked up this self-published uh, magazine here by the Howard Hughes Corporation, which has that promising title up there, right in your face forward. And uh, on page nine, it's showing the project. here, And actually uh, through one of the people who persons who live in there, and this is this gentleman here who is a chef. And this uh, picture here of the building is pretty much subtitled Bathing in the Evening Light. And I have to say, before it's evening and you can bathe in the light of the evening, you're facing this condition. I picked this here up. Oh, it's upside down. Sorry, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, at a postcard stand here. Uh, which is saying the golden sons of Aloha. And this is a very postmodern because if you ever have been in that golden sunset sun uh, without any protection, it's very, very hot still. So if, if buildings face that, and if we can go to the next slide, please, uh, like this building here, which is just down the road, and we've been talking about that some shows ago. The bottom right is a picture I happen to take from the Ward Starbucks uh, close by our project here. And you can see how the sun is basically baking that. So there's no bathing in the sun, there's baking in the sun. And we know what happens to us when we bake in the sun, which we can see at the top right. And this is what that building here does. Our building, if you remember the North Era, is not that unsimilar. Uh, there, um, is, there are some parts who are actually the long side to the west is actually facing that pretty harsh and brutal and hot uh, sunset sun. So how did the, does the building react to that? How does the building deal with that? We will see on the next slide here. As you can tell, we were closely watching the building going up. And you can see they're putting some clothing on the building, which um, is what it is. And you might say, well, you know, maybe then that's blocking the sun. So maybe people stay cooler in there. So let's check that out and go inside of the building. Next slide, please. Well, there we go. Uh, in a very ironic way, the sort of the realtor thought he has to decorate, had to decorate the single wall unit AC with these pillows here, with these cushions. So implying that could be a couch. So you sit on your monster aggregate machine that obviously is necessary to keep that building cool. However, the poor people or the more proletarian working class people you know, can't afford as much glass as the other millionaires, which you can see in the background, which is the earlier Howard Hughes pro uh, project here. But they still aren't protected uh, from the sun as much. So even though they have less view, 
they still got that, nas that nasty machine that is burning fossil fuel. And I know about you, but makes me sick. Um, as said in many shows, I've lived in a Waikiki Grand for seven years, never had that nasty machine on. Our uh, co-host here, who is uh, today unfortunately uh, uh, loaded with work, DeSoto Brown from the Bishop Museum, has to pull an all-nighter. He's working on a Manoa Hotel exhibit, so good luck with that, DeSoto. But DeSoto has shared as well that um, he grew up without air conditioning and he's still living without. So guys, it's, it's doable, it's possible. Looking at a floor plan of a typical unit here, a smaller unit, you can see it's rather generic. It's one bedroom. What's really unfortunate is that the bathroom is basically facing the double loaded corridor, so there's no natural ventilation. You rely on that uh, artificial exhaust. Um, I have that and I have to deal with mold in the bathroom. The Halle uh, Nohana has, had done that better. It's a double single loaded corridor that gets natural ventilation to the bathroom. So let's uh, look how then the uh, next slide, how the realtors and the illustrators basically give you eye candy, how you could possibly furnish your unit. And if you take a close look, that nasty AC unit is still there, but it's sort of neatly you know, hidden behind that sofa there. Uh, so that's the lure. And there's a ceiling fan, but you know, what's the purpose to run that ceiling fan? Ceiling fans are one of the prime vernacular devices to stay cool in the tropics because hot air is rising up and then you can take that out. But there is no such thing of this one here. All you're doing is basically pushing around the fossil fueled AC air in this unit here. Go to the next slide. Um, while we were watching it closely, we got our hopes up about a particular element that we dedicated a show to, which is that uh, a couple of organizations on the island, amongst them the DPP, the Department of Permitting and Planning, with Tim Hugh as its uh, main guy, to, together with Ebitz Howard Wig, known here in the house as the author and the host of Code Green, and Socrates Pratakos have all teamed up and saying we're going to change code, that we can bring something back, that is something very tropical exotic, which is exterior fire stairs. I'm using these as my cardio in the morning, and it's wonderful to go up and down on them. So you can see on the side of the building here, uh, that going up and go to the next slide. Once the building was further completed, you can see that staircase there um, being a steel staircase outside, which again, the Department of Permitting and Planning recognized that rather than in New York City where it snows and when the building is on fire uh, and you might want to save your life not to break your neck on an over iced um, exterior um, a metal staircase, that ice we don't have here. So we might not want to enclose it. And it, used, it wasn't the way, way back. And the International Building Code unfortunately sort of superimposed that on us, sort of threw the mumu over our beloved easy breezy staircases and the department together with Howard and Socrates were sort of unmumuing and sort of stripping them naked again, at least giving the legal background for them. But uh, go to the next slide. Unfortunately here then, boo, we, what did we do? We enclosed it, we dense glassed it and go to the next slide. Now you don't even realize if you wouldn't know that there's a staircase behind that. So we're saying this is really a lost opportunity and what are these measles or pimples or acne, the, the yellow ones doing on the building? We don't know. If they would have been operable vents for the staircase that you can get some air in there, would have been uh, nice, but uh, didn't happen. Talking acne and pimples, I see that really big yellow one there that I want to squeeze or at least take a look at it before that. And let's go to the next slide. We're doing that. So this is probably the most spectacular about the building. Uh, the owner and the developer calls this sky lanais, and that sounds very fancy and sounds indeed tropical exotic because this one here in particular seems to be all open. You can have party there, you feel the breeze, you have the view, nothing connects you from, uh, disconnects you and it keeps connecting you to this most wonderful uh, natural environment that we here, have here on the islands. So this is a rendering, so this is a suggestive illustration, as we like to call it. Let's go to the next slide, which is how the promise has been kept. These are some people checking it out while it was close to being finished and, and take a look. 
And I'm, I'm not afraid of heights, nor am I afraid of the Baris. So I think this is a rather brave move uh, to do that. Uh, go to the next slide. When you look how it's sort of finished, you know, both the tile and the furniture seems a little um, love deprived as far as the uh, architectural attention that was given to it. So it looks very bling from the outside, but then doesn't seem uh, uh, equally um, appealing from, from the inside. And it's sort of at that point, we're playing the architectural or pop cultural historians here now for the next couple of slides. And let's go to the next one. Uh, Germanians like me and the younger ones have to do their homework and look this up. Uh, there used to be a TV series uh, in the other tropics, way over at the other end of the continental United States. And it was the sort of, while we had, as we were talking quite a bit in previous shows, we had Hawaii Five O and Magnum PI, and we in fact have them again in form of their reboots. Um, there was something similar in Florida, and that was called Miami Vice. And in fact, that's been rebooted as well. But this is the original one here, uh, which, is, which is pure 80s. And there is a, this is from a trailer that you guys can bring up online. And this is the sort of the opening scene that's always the same, where the camera walks through. Uh, the main feature, which I haven't snapshot, is, is Don Johnson and his partner basically speed boating in one of these cigar boats, these high speed boats uh, through the ocean there. But then the camera walks through the city as well, which is a background for the, for the settings. And at the top uh, right and the bottom left, you can see that's a featuring a building that for my generation, uh, well, I'm a product of, of the late era of postmodernism, which the 80s were. And I was, uh, finally came to the United States, which was like the holy land for me in the early 90s. And that was the hottest building that you can think of. Architect was Architectonica. And this is their building. The building is called Atlantis. Uh, it's a uh, high-rise slab uh, containing condominiums. And again, it was, it was featured and basically showcased in the opening scene um, of Miami Vice. And right after that came the Bikini Girls, just to show the environment and the culture there based upon the climate, right? You're naked or close to that, as Soda was closing one of the recent shows. So let's check that building out a little closer. Next slide. And you know, the, the building wasn't just about commerce. It wasn't just a developer project. It, it was. It was a manifesto, and these are drawings that basically are symbolic for that, that they did. You see, obviously, this is upscale here. So you see a Rolls Royce convertible cruising down the boulevard there and having this building as a sculpture. And the building then, as you can see, is sort of perforated, punched out, and added to. And another very typical 80s postmodern drawing uh, of it as an axonometric in the, in the upper right corner. So let's move on. Next slide here. This is how the building looks like if you want to buy a unit. And if you break down the square footage and the cost is actually not far off from the affordables here in the building we're talking about. So I would rather say from inside out, remember the previous atmosphere, I go for this one here. And it is, you know, an all lever house international style building, fully glazed exposed to the sun, probably climatically not appropriate. But again, way back in the 80s, under President Reagan, no one really cared so much right, about energy efficiency. In fact, it was the opposite. right? Carter cared and Reagan not anymore. But these times are gone. That's almost four uh, decades um, um, away in the past. So again, think this over about you know, cost of building and quality of living. Let's move on to the next slide here. And what, what our building our, uh, doesn't have is lanai's. And again, you have lanai's here in Florida and you don't have them in Hawaii. That's something to think about or makes you think. Next slide. But the most iconic of the building that the camera, in fact, in that trailer um, of Miami Vice zooms into is that opening. And that sort of reminds us of the feature we know from our building here. This one here, however, let's check it out a little closer. Let's go to the next slide. 
This one it looked a little bit more passionately uh, furnished. This one had a jacuzzi or a small pool. So th that is something, you know. Ours has a pool too, but it's sort of down on the plinth level. We, we see that later on. And it has another, a couple of other features. There's actually a mature, a pretty, you know, uh, big palm tree there. And then there are these other architectural elements, like these spiraling, very red, very sculptural staircase. And on top of that next slide, uh, that, that yellow looks familiar to us, right? From our big pimple in our building. And this one here was, was this wall. And that wall is very sort of neatly sculpturally uh, created. It's, it's a wavy uh, uh, wall and it sort of reminds, I mean, this is Florida. This is close to Cuba. This is somehow very sort of Mediterranean as well, if you want so. There's some Louis, Louis Barragan influence in there. Um, very sort of quotational. And this is what the, 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 the 80s and postmodernism was about quoting sort of and, and, and mimicking other elements mostly from, from the past. So next slide. Uh, this is again how this composition comes about. And it's in fact, you know, very very um, passionate in, in, in its way it's been composed and, and comprised of these elements. So uh, next slide is, uh, again, it came, it, there, there, was a, there was a concept, and again, a manifesto, and I've never seen any of these conceptual, this is how every, that's how we urge the emerging generation, this is how every project should start with an idea, and with a, with a, with a dream. And this sketch here, as sort of naive and immature it might seem, but it certainly speaks about that the architect had that vision and had this idea. And to the right, you can see the execution that's, that's equally passionate. And, and you know, considering the 80s, which were just about the fake and the surface and the makeup, there's some pretty nice craft uh, been executed here. So uh, next slide, uh, DeSoto immediately sort of architecturally categorizing it says, oh, this is very Memphis. And this is who many consider the founder of the Memphis movement. This is a Torah Satsas here. In architecture, however, we got spared on postmodernism. Luckily, I have to say, many American cities got really trashed by stupid, invasive, hermetic, just formal uh, towers all over the United States. We got spared, but a little bit sad we sort of got it, got hit by it delayed. At the very bottom left, you see a, a, a building that's from the early 90s when postmodernism was actually over, but I guess we're, we didn't quite get it. And this is the A Ali'i place. And um, this is what I learned from De Soto is, is a plant um, and, and a flower. And, and this name is now maybe almost ironically used again for the next Howard Hughes Tower to go up that we will then take a closer look. But the plan is at the very, on the left side in the middle here. And it reminds me, I'm sorry, uh, if, uh, about when you break your leg and your bone is sticking out. So I'm not quite sure what goes on again. It seems a very formal gesture that uh, we should be past formal, we should be performative in many ways. And that's what we try um, again. We're, you know, in a show, in a recent show, we were pointing out again the name uh, Ali and their project and that it has sort of more of, you know, dynamic, more affordable furniture, which, which is a good thing. But again, this is not an affordable building. That's the problem. So only the rich ones are able to afford that. Well, as we say, maybe, the poor ones, the proletarians, would need that more than the rich ones. Let's uh, move on to the next slide and go back to us here. At the very bottom left, you see a gentleman that you will see a lot in the future because we're going to do um, uh, quite some shows with him in the future. And this is Mr. Ronald Lindgren. Hi, Ronald. Ronald has been with us for the last couple of days uh, around the National Docomomo Symposium. And we were uh, cruising around and having a coffee here at the Starbucks. And he was um, looking up at the building and, and, and I'm quoting Ronald now. He basically, once we talked about the sort of quoting uh, or mimicking or copycatting uh, Architectonica way back 40 years later, he basically said, well, Architectonica being truly postmodern was making a joke. 
And it was a pretty good one, as we also sort of went through and sort of agreed. And he said, this one is a really bad joke. So that's quote unquote. Ronald, and what capacity and authority does he have to say that? You will see even later in this show here and then in many shows to come. Let's go to the next slide here. And he calls it that postmodernism to be continued, obviously, is shallow. It's just on the surface, and you can't trust even anything you see. So these are two of the details of the building. The podium is basically clad with what looks like wood, but if you look at the joints, you don't basically mortar joint, cement joint, the wood. So this is a ceramic, in best case, or in worst case, a vinyl that wants to look like wood. And up there, you can see what's, you know, it looks so fancy. The, the, the yellow stripes is basically just lipstick on. And well, you can almost see where this is going, what we're saying, which kind of animal we are referring to. However, we don't want to insult pigs, I guess. So let's go to the next slide. And it's sort of particularly kind of sad because Architectonica, the firm, basically has moved on uh, to do some pretty, uh, you know, more performative buildings. This is a building in Miami at the Bay. I think it's named Bay something. And you can see they did some more, I mean, lots of lanais, obviously, now, and they're sort of zigzagging. And, but anyway, so they create more of a performative ornament. I guess, and they still keep their little signature style of their colored gimmicks in the building, which is fine because they're more sort of subordinate to the design. We almost would have had one of these buildings because at the top right is what they call the Vida. This was a, a McNaughton and Kobayashi development that unfortunately got pulled. That, um, and uh, our activist journalist, Kurt Sandburn, got very excited about it because it actually was the reintroduction of a single loaded corridor and we were heavily debating and arguing if sort of the sort of the butt that it was creating towards the mountains to Mauka being comprised of the staircases and the elevators would have been a sexy butt or not. So this is where we basically left with a discussion because unfortunately we don't know because the project, uh, as said, got pulled. Next slide, please. Um, this is very early, from, pulled from the web, um, illustrative um, you know, renderings from the building. Something that got value, value engineered is, is that strip of glass on the uh, most um, northeast end, which would have brought in light, obviously also sun, so you could have, should have shaded that, but it would have brought light in the otherwise, unfortunately, now uh, dark and sort of shining, movie shining like uh, double-loaded dark corridor. And, and again, the, the biggest thing seems to be for them, as you can see with the biggest printing here, is common area are these sky lanais. And next slide. Um, we, the Soda and I discussed this, and we thought, you know, it's almost like you can see down there, which is actually the greatest thing in Kaka'ako isn't the buildings, is the artwork. And it really is sort of a cry out of locals and saying, you know, please evolve our culture and, and keep it gritty and keep it natural, sort of rewild it almost. And we're thinking along the lines, um, you know, you should have basically almost inverted the whole concept of the building, keep the basic living unit open, sort of stack on eyes, as Kurt calls it, and keep it easy breezy. And then when a storm comes through, basically, uh, escape into the, which code has already in place, to the safe rooms. This reminds us not in a literal, because we're not postmodernist, but modernist, and in a, in, a, in a way of the cocoa nuts on a palm tree, where, which is solid, and you basically could, could flee and escape into these closed rooms until the storm is over. When I did the research on the architect of this project, I found it really sort of ironic that at the top right, this is the architect who is LA based. The name is A.C. Martin something, which sounds like really funny, but it isn't because their real name. And this is a building that I did in the early 60s. Very cool bioclimatic tower with these horizontal three soleils that were shading a glass box. So again, they should have stayed in their tradition and, and blessed us with that here half a century later. Next slide. But they didn't, and this is once again, somewhere on their website, again, they use the natural environment as a branding a precedent and idol, but then here on the podium deck where this sort of uninspired playground is that you don't want to see your kid playing, there's no shading there. Well, at some point that lonely tree gets larger. So 
but otherwise you get baked there and you're burning your feet because this is not cool grass. This is hot plastic called AstroTurf. Next slide. Um, currently in the Howard Hughes Corporation showroom, you can see a model. And on the top left is like the streetscape. It doesn't look very inviting. Uh, you got this fixed glazing, these awnings that don't do anything, Long's drugstore is going there. Then you got that hedge that's separating you from the building. And there's a bus stop. And in the future, top right, the, the hard, um, heavy rail will basically cut very close and actually have a stop very close to the building. So again, uh, there's down there is the model in the Howard Hughes uh, showroom. And they have an Aloha shirt exhibit. And the Aloha shirt is a symbol of easy breezy. And you know it's sort of almost ironic to see an uneasy breezy hermetic building next to these Aloha shirts. I don't know if they're aware of that. So let's face out with some positive polemic propositions here as we always do. Next slide. Uh, we're suggesting something like that. Uh, why don't you keep everything open? The structure is exposed as uh, Ronald calls it, uh, structural expressionism. You get local food vendors, farmers markets, maybe a water curtain wall instead of a fixed curtain wall because we have the potential of evaporative cooling here in our very specific special tropics. Next slide. And if you want to go for, and this is Primitiva 1 that has also been proposed for Block D here uh, in Kaka'ako, so not that far away. And that would have, you know, still sort of compartmentalized units, but they would be very sort of multifunctional and things popping in and out. So kind of reimagining the, the, kind of the micro unit scene. And once again, it's all easy breezy. It's open to the air. It's using uh, vegetation as fenestration. Uh, next slide. Um, and again, or you go one step further, Primitiva 2 is basically just bare bones and cascading landscape where basically locals can dwell as they like the most and do the best over the weekends on the beach, put up their tent. You might think this is all weird and probably not possible. Next slide, which is the second to last one here. This is um, Ronald Lindgren again here. Down there is what made it to the title postcard of the whole National uh, Docomomo Symposium. These are the color hub apartments by Killingsworth, Brady, Lindgren, and Stricker, how the name, how the firm is called. And uh, Ronald is here up in front of a perfect fenestration just as we were talking, vegetation in a trough and a curtain behind. It was executed and designed by his partner, Larry Stricker, and this is the Ihilani Resort. And to the left, um, or at the very bottom, this is a Julius Schulman picture. And Julius Schulman is the great hero of Andrea Brezzi, who was our generous photographer through the uh, symposium. And he took us to his home, which are the Kahala apartments, apartments. And that's just next to the Kahala Hilton. And the very top left, bigger picture is from his apartments here. So again, um, this is island tradition. What we're talking about is might be weird, but not impossible because this has been done uh, in the past. We just need to reactivate that. So we're at the end of the show and the last slide here. Again, the show was curated and created together with the Soto. And uh, we were saying, you know, we need these new buildings because what's happening right now as Trump's place out there and the other fake tropics and, and Trump running around like crazy, the new generation like Greta and friends, they're basically coming up and they won't put up with all this stuff. And here in Hawaii, we're planting down there is like planting 10,000 trees as part of the sort of global reforesting initiative. We have a new local food. Uh, movement. We see that uh, down there, the, this is the local newspaper's title page just last week after the show we ran by that to see that global warming is happening here and the cost of electricity goes up because people are more and more air conditioning the heck out of it and more desperate. But we don't need that. We need to just do what DeSoto is lobbying for at the top right in his famous uh, basically Plato Ye and, 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 um, an encouragement to say there's an incredible post-contact tradition of innovation on the island and we need very fast to ar have architecture return to that. So that's our message to you guys and we're at the end of the show and we look forward to see you next time again for another episode of Human Humane Architecture. 
uh, next time uh, next week. The Soto is back, you promised. And until then, please stay very tropically exotic, exotically tropical. Bye-bye.